Skip these notes. Try these different notes. So good evening. How's everybody doing? So is it okay with you if I take my hat off so I can see you all? Okay, good. Because otherwise I'm going to get pretty hot. And uh, if you've ever heard me talk before, uh, what you need to know is uh, I'm pretty informal. So you can ask me questions as we go along. But if you want to get out of here within an hour, you might want to think about asking questions at the end. Because if you get me on a tangent, uh, I could go on forever and ever. And it might be better than what I have written to talk about. All right, so we'll go there. <clears throat> so it is all about tomorrow. So we're going to spend as much time talking about what we've done in the, the last decade. But also, what I want to focus on is what are the future challenges, or as I like to put it, you know, what keeps me up at night. And then also, I want to talk a little bit about making the park relevant and how do we all need to do that. But it is the centennial. So it's my job to ask you questions now, and I come with prizes. So you ready? Okay, they're all like two to three to four part questions. So you have to listen to the question, and then you can raise your hand, and then I'll identify you. Now you have to answer all parts, and if you get the second part wrong, then I go to the next person. And then uh, if you started it off and you raise your hand again, you'll have the benefit of the answers from person you know, number two. All right, so we'll see what we can do here. Okay, let's start off easy. Are you ready? Okay, how many parks are there in the national park system? What is the largest and what is the smallest? Three parks. This is great, this will eat up all my hour. <laughs> if you're close, I start giving you brownie points. Oh, come on, I know you're not all that shy. 59 total, okay, so when I say national parks, I mean in the entire system. So I'll let you start over. Yeah, no, oh, national park simis units. No, all units. Monuments, memorials, historic parts. But I'm gonna give you credit to start because that was really good. Okay, yes. Okay, you're, okay, now you go to the second one, because you're close. Now what's the largest? Okay, who's next? No, or else you would keep going. Yes. How many? State park. Okay, so the lar how many number? How many in the park system? Yeah, well, she was close. Okay, she was a lot closer. But what's your second choice? No, who's next? Ooh, okay. Elias, Wrangell St. Elias. Keep going, what's the smallest? Oh, no. No? Okay, last chance. No. Good try, though. Good try. Okay, so you're going to win. Congratulations. 413 parks. 413. Remember, they all represent you know who we are, the fabric of America. So they go anything from national parks to national memorials to national historic parks. You know, uh, so we really have the whole gamut. The largest one is Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve. 13.2 million acres, about the size of West Virginia. All right, and then the smallest, I have to read it. Thaddeus Kus Kiosko. And you know who that is? Oh, you're looking it up. Oh, aha. Uh -huh. Well, see, but she didn't chime in, so that's pretty good. It's only a 0 0.02 acres, and uh, he was an engineer during the uh, Revolutionary War. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson said he was one of the best patriots he had ever met. And he's also responsible for designing 
and building the fort at West Point. Okay, so there we go. So that was number one. Okay, okay, now you're nice and warmed up. Yes, Pennsylvania. That's where. Wrangell St. Elias in Alaska. So if you know Alaska, well, Alaska looks like this, right? Wrangell St. Elias is this whole corner here. It butts up to Kluwani National Park, the Canadian park. All right, now I have a refrigerator magnet, so you can add it. All right, so here we go. All right. A little tougher this time. Okay, how old is the national park system? What was the first national park? And who was the president? Yes. Okay. Right? Grant. All right, very, very good. All right, now this one, you get the mug. Now this one is not easy. In fact, I had a, I had a couple of times ago. Oh, okay, I get it. All right, so what is the origin of the National Park Service Arrowhead? Now you can't see it anymore. Oh, whoops, it's up there. The origin of the National Park Service Arrowhead. So basically, what does it mean? So if you look at it, it's up there. What do you think it means? It's up there too. Raise your hand. Okay, it's going for another one. Okay, now you're all warmed up, right? Yes, sir. Right, right, so it was actually first a state park. It was a grant by Abraham Lincoln, but he granted it to the state of California to take care of in the year 1864, which is what's going on then, is the Civil War. So you can imagine you know, what's going on in the country, and the president has his bill on his desk that says, hey, hey, what do you think about establishing a park? You know, and it's like, really, it's a Civil War. But he was so foresighted that he, you know, he did. So that was really good. And it wasn't until 1890, in which the federal government took it back from the state of California. There was a lot of really uh, good reasons for that. One is the way it was being managed. They thought it should be taken care of a little higher standard, okay? So let's, uh, let's start talking about this evening. So as we said, uh, this is the centennial, and I asked you all of our questions. So it's been a great year to celebrate. We've had a wonderful year. Here at the, the Channel Islands, we've had lots of celebrations. We've reached out and touched hundreds of people, thousands of people. And I'll even tell you, with some of the programs we did this year, we've gotten up to some of our, our reaching of up to 5 million people. And it's all because of some of the innovative technologies that we're using. But let's start in the beginning. And so everybody knows who this guy is, right? Oh, Pinchot, he's a little older than Pinchot by maybe almost 100 years, maybe. But, uh, not quite 100 years. This was hard, and I, the reason I want to bring this up is, you know, this idea of a national park is older than we all think, because we think Yellowstone in 1872, we think Yosemite, but really what was happening is you had people like this gentleman, who's George Catlin, that when he was traveling across the, the middle of the United States, he was an artist and an entrepreneur and a writer. He, de he determined that hey, look, there's this great section of the United States that really ought to be set aside of what he called a nation's park. Let me read to you what he wrote, and uh, I believe it, yeah, I'll tell you exactly what the year was. He wrote this in 1833. So Catlin became acutely aware that the balance of nature was being destroyed because robes were being made of bison and nothing else was being used but the meat. And where the Indians were being asked to hunt the bison, they were being paid in whiskey. And he thought this was a big mistake in 1833. He goes on, to, and what he wrote in his book, Letter and Notes, on the manners, customs, and conditions of the North American Indian, he said, this strip of country, and this is roughly the strip he's talking about, which extends from the province of Mexico to Lake Winnipeg on the north, is almost one entire plain of grass, which is and even must be 
useless to cultivating man. Like can you imagine that in 1833 he's saying useless to cultivating man. It is here, and here chiefly, that the buffalo dwell, and with, and hovering above them, live and flourish the tribes of Indians, whom God made for the enjoyment of the fair land and its luxuries. It is a melancholy contemplation for me who has traveled, as I have, through the realms and seen this noble animal in all its pride and glory, to contemplate it so rapidly wasting from the world, drawing an irresistible conclusion to, which one must do, that its species is soon to be extinguished. 1832. And with it, the peace of happiness, if not the actual existence of the tribes of Indians who are joint tenants with them and, occup and occupancy of this vast and idle plain. And what a splendid contemplation too when one who has traveled these realms and can duly appreciate them imagines them as they might in the future be seen by some great protecting policy of the government preserved in their pristine beauty and wildness in a magnificent park where the world could see for ages to come what a beautiful and thrilling specimen for America to preserve and hold up to the view of her refined citizens in the world in future ages, a national park containing man and beast and all the wild and freshness of their nature's beauty. 1834. I think that's some pretty forward thinking. That even back then, when you know we're really thinking about as the the American destiny is that we're thinking about how it is that we move to the West. How is it that we conquer these new lands? How do we push people out of these lands? How do we make it profitable for ourselves? And you have one gentleman who's saying, wait, maybe there is another purpose for these types of lands. So George Kaplan. You guys are more familiar with these two guys, right? Who are they? And John Muir, right. And so the reason I put uh, Teddy up here and John Muir is this is you know, one of those famous conversations because John Muir was very concerned about the preservation of the world. And he was very concerned about Yosemite. Because there was a person who was uh, in charge of forestry under Teddy Roosevelt, and I heard his name over here, Gifford Pinchot, who was definitely that, the, what they would say, the father of conservation or wise use of resources. Because you know when you look in the dictionary and you look up the word resource, um, what do you see? You see the definition says oil and gas and timber and coal. That's what we thought of as resources. Today we don't think as natural resources as being those things necessarily. It would be biology, they would be plants and animals and, and nature, things of that, that sort. But in this conversation, you know, part of it is talking about Hetch Hetchy and you know, should you dam Hetch Hetchy or not. So you know, Muir was the more of everything's connected to the land and we gotta preserve these, these very uh, pristine and beautiful places. Now Teddy Roosevelt becomes very instrumental in the National Park Service, because in 1906, Congress handed him a very unique law, and that was called the Antiquities Act. And with the Antiquities Act, it gave the president actually the authority, not Congress, but the president the authority to set aside lands that were of specifically, specifically for scientific novel, or really to stop the pillaging of archeological sites in the Southwest. We were very concerned that a lot of our culture we weren't calling it our heritage at the time, but a lot of our culture of America was disappearing because people were robbing from old Indian sites. And there was, you can find a lot of art history in Europe in the museums instead of in America in the museums, or better yet, in America on the sites where they were originally found. So Teddy used that power of the pen and he created lots of national parks. But at that time, they were called national monuments, places like the Grand Canyon. That was a national monument first. Teddy Roosevelt pulled it outside. He also started the National Wildlife Refuge System. Because as you all know, Teddy Roosevelt was an avid hunter. He also believed that you need to protect these species. So he, he started that process also. Something like 33 different national monuments were created under Teddy Roosevelt. So he really believed in using his authority to protect our wild lands. 
You know, the one thing I always like uh, people to remember is just this. Of all the things that you'll see up on the screen that tell about who we are, it's really the National Park Service's Organic Act that was established in 1916 by Congress. And uh, I would read it to you, but I'm going to let you read it yourself. But I want to point out a couple of things about it. And i got to remember where the pointer is, and I think it's here. So you notice it says scenery. And if you heard me talk before, I do like to talk about scenery, because that word scenery comes in there by a very famous landscape architect. Anybody want to know who that was, who made sure that word got in here? Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted. It's actually his son who made sure it got in here, because Frederick Law Olmsted was, had passed away. And most of you know Frederick Law Olmsted because he designed Central Park. And what else did he design? Yosemite Valley. Oh yeah, Yosemite Valley. So the way you go into the valley today and where you pull out with your car and view the waterfalls, that was Frederick Law Olmsted's design of how that would be done. So that's how scenery gets in there. You know, and remember, scenery is a big part uh, during the uh, early 1900s because we as Americans are trying to figure out who we are when we compare ourselves to the old world, you know, Europe. You know, and they had all these great man-made features, but what we had were these great natural features, these cathedrals like Yosemite and Yellowstone. And so scenery becomes very important. But you also notice it says natural and historic objects, so keep that in mind. And then the wildlife. Hey, uh, Bryson, you spelled wildlife wrong again for me. Uh, you know, do you guys, hmm, is that spelled wrong? It is one word, isn't it? Yeah, is that right? Is that what happens? Now, actually, Bryson didn't misspell it. That's actually how it is spelled, because Congress intended that to be all nature. Okay, so you know, they, you know, we're not, we don't have these fancy words like ecosystem and things like that yet. All right, so uh, wildlife was purposely spelled this way. But look at this. It's to provide for the enjoyment of the same and in such matter that will leave them unimpaired. That is the real trick. Whenever you look at a national park and think, what's going on? And why can't I do this? Or why can't I do that? Well, part of that is because the manager is trying to figure out, is that going to cause impairment? Because if it's going to cause impairment, Congress said, no, you cannot allow that. And uh, it's, it's very interesting under different administrations, this word gets redefined a few times. But look at it. It also says for the enjoyment of future generations. Some, some people have said, you've got a dual mandate, National Park Service. You're supposed to conserve, unimpaired, but for the enjoyment of future generations. How do you do that? Because as generations change, everybody's needs, desires, wants, they all change too. Well, the courts have said, National Park Service, you can't provide enjoyment for future generations unless you have conserved things unimpaired. So it's not a dual mandate. It's you have to do this and this before you can do this. Right? And the courts have made that very clear. So that's been a big argument up until the 1990s. How do you do that balancing? So let me tell you a little bit more about Channel Islands. So if you're not familiar with our legislation, a few things I wanted to point out. You know, the first one is, look, nationally significant. Look at that natural. There's that word wildlife spelled correctly this time. And marine, ecological, okay, don't need to read it. But look at this one. Scientific values. That's very unusual in a park. Uh, this is one of the very unique parks where they said science was important. Science. And also administer on a low intensity limited entry basis. What does that mean to you? Well, what it means is visitor use within the park is to be limited. Carrying capacities. But look again, remember where it said impairment with our Organic Act? Look what it says here. To assure negligible adverse impact. And if you heard me talk years ago, I would always would ask people, how much is negligible? Is it this much or is it this much? You know, tell me how much negligible is. You know, that's really up to the manager to try and figure out. But also look at special fragility and sensitivity of park resources. It makes the Channel Islands a pretty tough place to manage. So let's talk about some of the challenges that um, I've uh, tried to deal with since I've been here. You all know about the creation of marine reserves that was done. A lot of the, the idea of coming about and looking at a new way to manage fisheries was based on a lot of the long-term research, science, that was done in this park, looking pr uh, principally at abalone, but also because Anacapa Cove 
have been closed to all fishing since 1981. So you could go in that area and see what does an area look like that might uh, resemble some form of naturalness. And what you could see were big differences from areas that were fished versus areas that weren't fished. So it led the state of California to look at maybe a different way to manage fisheries resources. And so here you have what are the, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, you have the uh, marine reserves and then the conservation area that's set aside, uh, that are set up around the islands. Now you realize um, our boundary only goes out one nautical mile. This dotted line is the state's boundary and it goes out three nautical miles. And then you got this darker boundary, which is the National Marine Sanctuary. So within that one mile, we, got, we have three people doing jurisdiction. National Park Service, and of course now the state here and the Marine Sanctuary. And then the Marine Sanctuary has this whole area also. And you all know that we do, uh, we do uh, manage this cooperatively with the Nature Conservancy, Santa Cruz Island, the west half, or actually two thirds, uh, three quarters basically, of uh, Santa Cruz is managed by the Nature Conservancy, and then this part by the National Park Service, and then this is owned by the United States Navy. All right, but we manage it for the Navy. Well, yeah, that's a good question for the Nature Conservancy. You know, I can't speak for them. Uh, but, you know, the, for the Nature Conservancy, they're not traditionally a landholder. But, you know, this is a, a very important piece of property for them because, you know, they have a, constitu a constituency and they've done some remarkable ecological restoration in partnership with us. And, and by them owning land and by them practicing ecological principles and doing some of these restoration projects, they are actually better at trying to export that technology to other countries and help them accomplish some of their ecological restoration uh, challenges. Now, you all know that we had rats, right? We all remember that. And you probably all know we were sued over um, getting rid of the rats. Um, now, that happened you know, right before I came. But, uh, and you all know that we had pigs, and uh, that happened while I was here. It was the eradication of the pigs. And, you know, one of my, uh, you know, uh, well, it's sad when you see your picture in the newspaper and you're posted in the Hall of Shame. But, um, you know, these are, these are hard decisions. These, making ecological decisions are very difficult. And they're difficult because there are no easy answers. And we always seem to forget, how did these things get here to start with? And though somebody made a decision, maybe not the rats, they may have had the decision of a shipwreck, but on the pigs, somebody made the decision to put the pigs out there. And so I was making the decision to take the pigs off. You know, but it always just surrounded in a little controversy. But the reason we were getting rid of the rats was because of the, the merlets, right? The Xanthus merlet. Now, that's what we called it then, Xanthus merlet. What's it called now? The Scripps merlet, right. And so, um, you know, take a look at this. Is, uh, because of the work we did, uh, now how many of you know all about the Scripps murder? Okay, so a few of you. So you know that you know, most seabirds in general, most seabirds, once they hatch from their eggs, and then they go visit mom. Now in these, this case, when they're about two years old, they're about the size of a cotton ball. They jump off of Anacapa Island. And have you ever been there? Two days old, right? Two days old. They jump off this 100 plus foot cliff. Sometimes they miss it, most times they don't. They bounce all the way down, and they hit the water, and they get on mom's back, they don't go back to the nest. And then they eventually fledge, and then they only come back when they're sexually mature. So I would think we should give this bird a chance to live. I mean, look, that's a pretty hard life. But when you got rats eating your eggs, or even sometimes eating the adult birds, then you know they could easily disappear. So I want you to know that with all the work we've done on the Scripps Merlet, and also the work that's been happening in Mexico on the Coronados, that we have been able to bring this bird back. And in fact, uh, these were some of the headlines from the Fish and Wildlife Service. News release, island restoration supports conservation of two specific uh, uh, species of seabird. Now what they're talking about is the Scripps and the, uh, the Guadalupe merlins in this case. So what we're able to do is to protect this animal and prevent it from having to go on the endangered species list by being a little bit proactive by getting rid of a non-native animal, the rat. But you know, there's other things we've done for seabirds that we don't often hear about. And one is the actual restoration of the land. So and this is a scorpion rock. 
So look at Scorpion Rock in March of 2007 and look at it in February 2015. And uh, this was all about getting non-native plants off and then starting a nursery and putting native plants back on. And so now what we're seeing are birds coming back to this, uh, this little islet and nesting and then they're very well protected. And this one's closed to people. So it's not just getting rid of the non-native animals. Sometimes you also have to restore some of the, ha the habitat that's been overrun by uh, non-native uh, species of vegetation. Well, I don't know what happened there, but uh, that must have been a briefing, yeah. So then there was the fox, right? The whole fox situation. And uh, that, was, that really came into play as soon as I got here. The first thing that Tim Coonan handed me when I came into the office was, you know, the previous superintendent went and signed the fox re this fox restoration plan. Will you sign it? I was like, well, I thought I was here to help restore these islands. So I read through it and I said, this is really a good plan. So I signed it. We started putting it in place. And within a year, now I can tell you, it's a lot easier to restore a species if it's not on the endangered species list. But when it's on, there are some rules you have to go by. But, uh, you know, we had all the foxes, like on Santa Rosa, they were all in captivity. And then on San Miguel, they were all in captivity. And on Santa Cruz, the majority of them were in captivity. But I want you to know, because of all the support from the public, is that you all got behind us. We were able to get money. The Nature Conservancy was able to get money. People like you gave money. You know, I can't tell you how many school kids donated pennies to the uh, Friends of the Island Fox to buy radio collars so that we could put them on the foxes. And it was this year during the centennial, what a great birthday present, the fox was taken off the endangered species list. Fastest recovery of a mammal off the endangered species list in the history of the Endangered Species Act. You know, and a lot of that's because you all support what we're doing. And I have to say thank you for doing that. Because you could have made this a very rough challenge for us. But what about? We all know about the bald eagles, right? We all know. We didn't have any bald eagles. Why didn't we have any bald eagles? Because EDT, right? So we had to try and figure out. Do you put them back? They, they were always here. So one of the things we always talk about in ecosystem management is uh, it's like building a puzzle, right? Like building a puzzle. There's nothing more frustrating when you go to build that puzzle to find out that you're missing a piece, right? You look all over the place, you look on the floor, you can't find it. Okay, well, here's one of the missing pieces, the eagle. And then you find out when you're building it, you've got too many pieces, right? And it's like, okay, how that happened? Well, those are your non-natives. So it gets really frustrating when you're trying to build that ecosystem puzzle. And this is one of the ones we, want to, we wanted to put back. And, you know, and there's lots of great stories that we have about bald eagles. Lots and lots of stories. But uh, here's what I want you to know. is on the Northern Channel Islands, nine breeding pairs, at least 14 eggs last year, 50%. I'm not going to read all this to you. Eight chicks fledged. And this is where Princess Cruz is. is over on, that was you know, the one who was born here. Now, look down below here. This is the Pacific Region Bald Eagle Recovery Plan. These are the goals of the plan. And here's where we are. All islands are at 63% success rate. We're just off the goal. Fledgling attempts, they want one per nest. We're at 0.95. We're almost there. Yeah, it could be these last couple of years. The drought could have played a big, a big role in that. But the, but the beauty is, you can now go to the Channel Islands and see bald eagles. Well, here's one we never hardly ever talked about because most people don't know that we uh, reestablished peregrines out there too, right, peregrines. And, uh, you know, I, I love this one. It's like everybody show me your ring finger, you know, here because we can see all these, uh, these little tags. We can't see them here and here, but here. But, um, you yeah, know, how could you not love those guys, huh? Um, but, you know, we look at their, their success uh, over time. And again, let's look at the target is 68% and 1.5. And look where we are. A nut, nest success for uh, peregrine falcons and productivity. So now you can go out there and see peregrine falcons, another piece that was missing. And this is to give you some idea what the trend is for uh, peregrine falcons. Now, the reason uh, you see this gap here is uh, there wasn't a lot of monitoring going on between 2007 and then we got, uh, I'll call it a bucket of money from the Montrose Settlement Funds, which was the DDT lawsuit. And we were able to, to look at them and eagles more comprehensively. But you can see we're on a good upward trend for numbers of territories of peregrine falcons. 
give you some idea where they are. Yeah, isn't that amazing? I, you know, I looked at, uh, I was saying, my goodness, can we get any more peregrine falcons on San, on San Miguel? And then they said, well, you, why are you looking at Miguel? Look at Anna Kappa, you know? Yeah, look how small it is. What's that? And it does, right. And, and we're going to do something even more unique, and I'm going to talk about it now. Here is we're going to put a cam, uh, uh, one of those webcams on a peregrine nest. And it'll be the first webcam that we've been told of a wild nest. All the other ones you see are on buildings. And this is going to be one of the first ones. So you're going to be able to watch, uh, hopefully, peregrines from you know, the comfort of your home, having breakfast in bed. And that'd be kind of nice. So, you know, I had some infrastructure problems. And as you know, uh, this one was a headache for most of us. And that's, the, of course, the new, uh, the new stairwell on Anacapa. We uh, replaced the pier at uh, Santa Rosa. I remember my first trip to the pier with my daughter, who was two, and Dwight Willie saying, oh, I'll carry her to the top, and I'm like, oh. And as the boat hit the side of the pier, and you guys know, as the boat hit the side of the pier, you just hear this ratcheting back and forth, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what, what have I gotten into? You know, when you're a biologist, you're hoping to come here and do a lot of biology and some cultural resources, and when you come here and you have to do infrastructure problems, uh, challenges, it's a little tougher for us. Remember, that's the old uh, Anna Capper stairway. Remember that? Uh, we actually had to put PVC pipe on the handrails because they were rusting away so poorly that you would slide your hand down and you would cut yourself. And pieces of slag were falling off them and hitting people in the head. So uh, that was uh, quite the challenge to get that fixed. But you know, the other thing was the uh, we took on the old schoolhouse on the Santa Rosa Ranch. And you remember, this is what it used to look like. And uh, now what we've done is we put it back to its original size. So the original schoolhouse was just this building right here. So now we're back to uh, the, the period of significance when it was just a schoolhouse instead of being converted to a residence for somebody. So if you go out there today, you'll see a little bit different building. Well, back there it is. There you go. Now let's talk about some challenges. Okay. Yeah, so, and then you're going to say, well, yeah, but you forgot that one and you forgot that one. So I didn't want to be here all night. So I didn't want to get them all here tonight. But uh, here's one of the big ones and a cap of crane. So I condemned that uh, crane, I don't even know how many years ago. But it takes time to get money. Uh, and it's been in line. And then, uh, so you all understand when we go to get money, um, we compete on a national basis. And so they look at all the parks and what are their needs for line item construction, and then they decide who's going to get what money when. So we thought we were going to get money in 2016, and then something else important came up, and we thought 17. It looks like 2018, we're going to finally get a new Anacapa crane, and my staff will be so happy when that happens. Uh, so we, we have to quit you know, lugging things up the stairs, but also we won't have to use helicopters anymore to take stuff out there. So Anacapa crane on the horizon. Oh, so that's a great question. So we pull in, and there's actually a pipe that comes in right here. And so either with a barge, but what we've determined is we can actually do it cheaper with the Ocean Ranger with some big tanks. And we use a large fire pumps. And then we actually push the water all the way up to the water building back here. And, uh, and Sterling is going to come talk to you about this at the next uh, conversation that he has on Shore to Sea. But this is the Vale and Vickers uh, Ranch House, built, I believe, more than 1890. And so, uh, you know, it has no foundation. I bet you didn't know that. Uh, I bet you didn't know it doesn't have any shear wall protection. I bet you you didn't know it still has two wire electricity in it. Uh, and it needs a new roof, and it's sort of ratcheting. So Sterling is uh, going to oversee a project to put a foundation on it, get some new windows in it, get a new roof on it, and uh, make sure that we can protect this historic resource and share it with the public and tell the story of the ranching years on the island. Now, what you're going to also uh, notice when you go out there is, unfortunately, this tree right here is part of the problem. We thought we could save it. I've already received numerous letters. I'm not looking for any more letters. So just to be honest with you, but I have received numerous letters about not cutting that tree. And, uh, and I appreciate not cutting the tree because they do add character to the house. So we're going we're gonna to go ahead and start growing a, a new cypress tree so that uh, when we do have to take this one out, we can start to bring a new one back up and try and rebuild that uh, framing of the house with a cypress tree in the future. But right now, it is 
it's in a bad place. No, it's not, it's not native. It's not native. But because of a cultural landscape, uh, we try and, and keep some of the integrity of the landscape. And since it's a non-invasive tree in that area, we feel OK that we can manage it and we can put it back to non-invasive. There's other areas where we want to look at trees and be careful what we put back because we don't want to create an invasive problem. <clears throat> so here's something that keeps me up at night. When you get that call that says, oh, did you know there's a squid boat on your beach? And uh, my first question is, or thought is, what do you think it is? Rats. That's what I think, rats. So we're actually working on a biosecurity plan and going to work with the squid fishery to see how is it that maybe we could react very quickly to put rat bait on these boats immediately so when they go ashore. Because this one was actually high and dry. I mean, can you see it's actually land right here? And it found the only rock at Skunk Point. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's like the only rock. Um, and the, I'll tell you, the owner was very, very cooperative. We did get rat poison out there. He said his ship was clean. It was very clean. We had no worry. But what happens if we do get a dirty boat out there and it does have uh, rats on it? You know, we've got only about 48 hours to try and get, get the rats. After 48 hours, they can penetrate into the island. So we had, that keeps me up. We've had uh, five boat roundings this past year. Now, the other thing, yeah, they're not all uh, squid boats. A lot of them are pleasure craft. We've had one sink. Um, also, but the thing that you all probably don't know, if you all drove here, you know you had to have car insurance, right? Well, you know boaters don't have that kind of thing. You can, but how many do? And so it's really up to Vessel Assist to try and figure out, are they going to get reimbursed? There is no federal pot of money. There's a federal pot of money to get all the oil and greases off the boat, but not get the boat off the rocks. Well, then it becomes a problem for the sanctuary and myself is because now we got this boat, and what happens if it breaks up? Then we got a mess everywhere. So that, that keeps me up. Oh, he got pulled off. Yeah, he got he paid. He he paid everything to uh, a salvage company, and uh, everything came off nice and clean. Well, he had quite a bit of damage to his boat, but uh, he what's that? He did save the boat. Yeah, they had to put floats on it right away because it did have a, a considerable hole in it. So uh, I like to use this cartoon to talk to you a little bit about climate change. Um, uh, I understand the environment may be changing, and we won't be talking about climate change for a while. But uh, even if we're not talking about it, um, I'm going to talk to you about it. Okay? And uh, I I'm going to talk to you about it because it really means something more to me than it does most. So this was Santa Barbara one year ago. Santa Barbara Landing Cove on the island one year ago. OK, remember that El Nino we were supposed to have and all the rain we got last year? OK, right. We didn't get any rain, but we got a very angry ocean. Very angry. We saw 20-foot swells out here. Now, I couldn't find the most recent picture, but this pile is no longer there. That pile is no longer there. That pile is no longer there. And, and the crane is, because the crane's on a uh, pedestal, a concrete pedestal down here, and it's mounted to it. So we have had some engineers go take a look at it. And uh, we've done the pathometry. And we're hoping we're going to get some uh, money to try and get this back open um, within the year. Uh, so Santa Barbara will remain closed uh, for a period of time. OK, so um, then there's the scorpion. And uh, so a lot of people, if you don't know the story, the other's like, well, Russell, why'd you close? OK, well, I actually had done an engineering analysis on this pier a couple of years ago. And that's why we had these uh, guardrails put up, as they found that you know that would help strengthen the pier a little bit, because they're welded onto this um, bridge. Now, you all know this is a, a rail car, right? A flatbed rail car. So California is like the only state that adaptively reuses rail cars. It's a great idea. Unfortunately, they don't hold up very well in marine environments. They rust pretty quick. And so. Uh, after this little storm, I had them go out and take a look. And the engineer came back and said, he didn't believe that the rail car could hold its own weight. So then the question was, well, how many passengers can you allow to go on that here? Um, and there was a mitigation. 
We, I could have allowed people to go out on that pier if we would have, if Island Packers would have went out there every time, and we would have had water jugs set up on the pier that would mimic the weight, and they would fill up the jugs, and if it if it held up, then you could let people off, and then uh, every time you went out there, you'd have to retest it every time. It didn't seem very practical to me. So what we've done is um, we've actually uh, done an environmental impact statement, and we're looking at a new pier. And uh, But before we even get to the new pier, where the existing rail car is, we actually have a manufactured gangway that was supposed to be put in place last week, but they couldn't get a barge. And so now it's scheduled for the 16th. We're going to put a gangway here that's about 90 feet long. What's really neat about this is we've engineered it so that this gangway, when we go to build this pier, this gangway will get picked up, and it will become this gangway right here. So we're trying to save some money. And what we're also looking at is powering uh, in, making sure that all of our piers are in a uh, situation where we can power in. So our boat will no longer go here and use ladders either. You remember Joe Waisaki, you know, he died. And he died because he fell from a ladder. And he fell from that ladder and he hit his head on a boat. And what we want to do is try and take the, uh, some of the degrees of movement out of boats. Island Packers can do that because they power in to a pier. But we didn't build most of our docks, especially in Anacapa and Santa Barbara, to be powered into. They're not supported at the base. So we need to rethink how we do all of our designs so you can power in. Why do you power in? Keeps the boat from going up and down as much, and then going side to side, it, it's a, and they can hold it steady. Well, we're going to do the same thing with our boats, is we're going to widen this end so our boat can come long side, and we can match up to this landing right here. Now, I say it's a landing. Our goal is to get rid of ladders. We are going to try and get rid of ladders. This, is going, this gangway will be adjustable so that when Island Packers comes in, we will be able to take it and match it up with the bow of the boat. So there'll be a little bit of a gap for you to step across, but you'll always step forward. And when you are on the island and you get back on the boat, you're going to face forward and step across to the boat. No more holding onto a ladder and stepping backwards. Now, it's going to be a long process because we have five, uh, four, five piers we have to work on. Some of them we just have to maybe do some wells. But in this particular case, and this is scheduled for construction starting in uh, the winter of 2017. So hopefully we'll have temporary access, hopefully in another week. And then we'll have this with uh, moving forward and backward. I mean, never moving backward, always moving forward to get on and off the boat by the uh, early 2018. Yeah. Yeah, end of 2017. Yeah, 2017, 2018. Right, sorry. Right. No, no, right, right. Not January. Right. So all the all the environmental documentation is done, and now we're working on the design phase. In fact, I just went to Denver, took this in front of our development advisory board, and they told us to continue moving forward. Uh, no, I've actually been given the money to move this forward. Yes. So that's been asked, and so I'm going to go back to the engineers and see what we can do about a dinghy dock. Um, you know, it's, it's not as nice a place as prisoners, so I'm going to at least ask. Now, as long as it doesn't drive the price up, because I do have a fixed price that I have to work with. So uh, be looking for this. Yes? Uh-huh. End of, end of calendar year 17. Oh, yeah, yeah, next, next week. Next week. They're supposed to go in next week. That's what they promised me. Well, they promised me two weeks ago. Also, and before that, they promised me a few days before that, too. But it was about a barge. They couldn't get a barge uh, lined up. Yes? Yeah, so that, that's, um, that's really good that you uh, noticed that. Oh, 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 oh. You mean here? Right, so we've looked at all that bathymetry, it's all sand, and uh, we've also made sure that there was no eelgrass, so we had no eel eelgrass disturbance. That was part of the reason why we couldn't go back here, was because there is a rock right here, so low tides we had a skiff. And also, what people, uh, you know, they only think about maintaining this. Every winter we gotta maintain this. And so that gets washed away, and what other folks don't realize this is a significant cultural resource. It has actually uh, uh, burials, pretty nice burials. 
So we want to always try and avoid that. So yes, it is a little longer. It does come out about, it comes out to the same, uh, actually just a little bit deeper than this, but it was the, it had to be this uh, far out to get to deep enough water for our boats to accommodate. Yes. Yes, and we, and we uh, proposed steel piles also because it with sea level rise, um, of course, as I was discussing this with our development advisory board is, you know, they want to know what BFE was, base flood elevation plus two. So here, flood elevation here is nine, and then plus two would be 11. I had a plan for that. I told them, I, I don't really care how far the water comes up here. What I care is how high the water is here when it hits this pier. That, so we planned for it to, to come underneath uh, underneath it. So uh, that was important, but yeah, it'll be steel pile. And so if we do have a, a large sea level rise in 50 years, you can cut the piles and raise it. So concrete, you can't do that. All right, so uh, this is my next challenge too, is the scrub jay. You know, and the concern with the scrub jay, it really comes down to, uh, you all know that corvids are very susceptible to West Nile virus. Now, we don't have any West Nile virus on the islands yet, but the uh, climate change predictions would show we could change the climate enough on Santa Cruz that we actually would have a, a period of incubation for West Nile virus. And we do have the mosquito that carries the West Nile virus already on the island. So now we're trying to figure out, so what do you do about this bird? You know, did it exist on all the other islands? Maybe, maybe not. There's some anecdotal information that says that they did. And if they did, do we put them on the other islands? And what are the risks of doing that? What will it displace? You know, remember that islands aren't, do go through some theory they call island biogeography, where sometimes things come and sometimes things go. And now we're at a place where um, do you let a species actually go? But do you let it go if it's being human driven? And if you believe climate change is a human driven force, this really complicates it. So I'm going to pull a bunch of scientists together, help me on the science side, and then I'm going to pull a bunch of policy people to help me with uh, what do we do about policies. And this is one of my new problems. You know, for the first time, if you own a boat, you know what this is, Undaria. And I'm going to tell you, for the first time, we've now found it on Anacap Island. It's not supposed to be an open ocean, but we have it. Undaria. It's uh, on any of these docks underneath it, it's the, the seaweed that's growing on the docks. And so uh, it's, it's probably come out from boats. And one of the uh, concerns we're having is where we find it on West Anacapa is also a big area where there, uh, for uh, lobster fishermen. And so the question is, you know, they're, they're dropping their pots in this. And when they bring their pots up and then they're relocating their pots, are they moving the end area to different places? Now. You can't pick on just fishermen here because it's on the bottom of the boat. So we got to figure out how do we prevent this from occurring in the future. So the big part is how do we keep you all engaged? How do we have next the next generation love the park like you love the park? As we all know, there's about 16 million people between here and Orange County, 152 different cultures. How do we get those 152 different cultures to say that these national parks are as much theirs as they are yours? Well, we started that today. Today was a great day. We had kids, kids, who were naturalized because their parents went through citizenship and they became citizens today. Celebration here today, kids from 13 different Man, it was a great feeling to see these little kids and we gave them these gifts and welcomed them to their national park and tell them that you now own a part of America, something you didn't own when you lived in that other country. And so take pride in this great place that we call America and take pride in your national parks. So we started today in building relevancy, reaching out to new citizens, saying these places are important. This is the fabric of America, our national parks. We want you to visit them. We want you to enjoy them because we're gonna need you to protect them. And of course, there's Channel Islands Live. Right, And we keep improving on the technology, working with the Ventura County of Office of Education, but also with a new partner this year, explorer.com, or .org. And explorer.org, because of their work with us, and, uh, and also the Ocean Cam, you know we've now reached 5 million people this year? 5 million. 
How many people don't even know what happens in the ocean? And this is one way we can then make the park relevant to people and show them what's happening underwater. Talk to them, but also show them the ocean cam. You know, if you're really feeling stressed out, there's nothing better than putting on that ocean cam and watching the kelp. I mean, there's only one thing better than that. So that's the jellyfish at Monterey Bay. You know, but, uh, you know, try it next time you're stressed out. Just put on some good uh, Enya music, you know, and uh, watch the kelp go back and forth. Part of the naturalization ceremony, we did a little clip of Kelly Moore doing a welcome, underwater welcome, welcoming them as citizens of the United States. And the kids love it. The kids really love it. So again, it's bringing it into the classroom and then having the kids talk to the diver and seeing that it's, it's, really, um, it's really there. It, it's not fake, it's not a movie, it's not something you're watching on TV, it's not National Geographic. And then you know, this afternoon, even I learned myself, and some of you may know Sammy Guerrero, Samuel, who works for us. You know, he was born in a Mexican national park and became a citizen in 1999, and he works for the National Park Service. So we could talk about him with these kids who think, you know, is there a place for me in the National Park Service? Well, there's Sammy, and he works for the National Park Service, and he's from Mexico, and he became a citizen. So this, you know, we need to try and recruit these, these kids to remember that these places are theirs. Of course, then we had the secretary out this year, and uh, Lois Capps, Congresswoman Capps. And it was an exciting day, too, because when we took these, uh, these kids out, we took like 90 kids out that day. It couldn't have been more perfect. They called it management weather, I guess, because I was on the boat. It was flat as can be. We pull into prisoners. And there's a humpback. Mom and calf had to turn the boat off because she brought the calf right up to the boat. And this silly little sea lion didn't like all the attention, so he dives down, gets a mouthful of fish, pops his head up, and starts looking around. And then the dolphins come in on cue. And then as soon as we get on the shore, you know, the secretary's asking the kids about the fox, and what happens? A fox comes running out. So it was like, wow, wow, we couldn't have made this any better, you know? It was really great. Um, but, you know, that, that's what's so amazing about this park is, you know, how close we are to, um, I guess we call it civilization, but at least urbanization, and, uh, and how we can get away and we can go have this Serengeti experience out here in our backyard. But it's all because you guys all care. It really is because you all care. And then we got the, uh, the old bunkhouse on Santa Rosa, which is now a field station for Cal State Channel Islands. And so this past year, there's a sign, you know, they had over 3,500 student nights out there, bringing students, and as you, you may know that Cal State Channel Islands is a Hispanic serving institution. Bringing students out here that had never been in a national park, never been on a boat, never been on an island and spent the night. And I was out there the other, uh, well, a few months ago with the director of the National Park Service when we were delisting the fox and we went on a little hike and there was one of uh, the students out there and she had brought her sister and she was planning to bring her parents and they had never been in a national park before. And it's like, Dulce, this is great. Where are you from? Fox start. Well, you know, so we are changing lives. And now she sees this is, this is my park. And I'm going to bring my friends. I'm going to bring my family. And it was great. And what was she doing? She was doing photo monitoring, hiked out to Lobo Canyon with her sister to take photographs, report some data, and hike back. You know, and I just think it's great that we're changing their lives. They were given an, a national award for the uh, National uh, Biological Stations um, Association as uh, meeting diversity goals in the most diverse program. They've only been in the program for two years. So they're doing really a great job at Cal State. Now, how do you get involved? You get involved with people like Channel Islands Park Foundation. This is our nonprofit arm of the park. And uh, they're the ones who can ask for money and then uh, have projects up. They do have a website. Um, so you can go to Channel Islands Park Foundation. And I'm not allowed to ask you for money. I can just tell you how much money I need. <clears throat> but the, you know, the big thing is I want you to find your park. And when you find your park, I want you to do a couple things, actually three. I want you to learn something new. I want you to tell us how we are doing. And I want you to ask how you can help, because we're going to need your help. We're going to need your help, and we're going to need your kids' help, and we're going to need their kids' help. Because if we want to keep our national parks strong, we've got to believe that our national parks are important to us as a people. So with that, let me thank you all for coming. And I will stay here and answer as many questions as you want until Bryson kicks me out of the room. But I am the boss, so maybe I can stay a little longer.
All right, thanks, everybody. Here we go. Now the hard part. In the 10-year plan or the new plan, is there any plan for handicapped access to Santa Rosa or other oh, islands? Okay. So um, Santa Rosa, so the question was, did everybody hear the question? Handicap access? Okay, so the 10-year uh, plan is what the GMP, general management plans, used to be. Now they're 40-year plans, okay? And so that's part of the reason why we're uh, doing the Scorpion Pier the way it is, so it can accommodate a wheelchair. Or, you know, actually, uh, a group out of San Francisco, can't think of their name, but for the last two years, they have taken out uh, a couple of paraplegics, uh, quadri quadriplegics, and some blind individuals and actually had them crossing the threshold. And this year they skipped them to shore and those folks had a great time. So you know what, I decided we gotta buy one of these water uh, uh, over the sand wheelchairs. So now we have bought one of those, we're gonna buy a couple more, station them out there because if these travel, they're called traveling companions. If traveling companions is gonna work with us to help get uh, folks that have disabilities and challenges out there, we need to come halfway with them. Rosa, um, of course you can get there by air. You also know, um, we've also done an experiment. You can go to San Miguel by air now, too. Um, it's a little bit pricey, I'll tell you the truth. But if you fill the airplane, it seems pretty reasonable. But uh, you can go to San Miguel. You can fly there instead of going by boat. Um, but on Santa Rosa, you know, we tried with a dock, with a, a um, crane at the end of the dock, and we had that pod. And if you ever saw it, it looked like a spacecraft that was sitting there. Well, when we uh, bought that thing, the... Uh, Either nobody asked or the vendor never told us. They have a lifespan. Really a lifespan? We kept it covered and protected. They also had annual maintenance. That was about one to $2,000 a year of annual maintenance. And then after seven years, you have to buy a new pot. That was a little frustrating. So, um, you know, so the best we can do right now is aircraft until it's time to modify that pier in some way. So it'll always be tough. And I'm just not sold that the, uh, the pod idea is going to work. And, and, and most folks with uh, challenges, they want to have their own, they want to be under their own control. So even with the, the gangway approach at Scorpion, the um, slopes most of the time are going to be uh, at the right angles for them to wheel chairs up themselves. But there will be a couple times on extreme lows, or, you know, they're in the king tide periods, we're going to have to help folks get up the range. So Rosa by air for now. I, I put enough money in that pier for right now. I'm going to focus on Scorpion. Yeah. Okay, Bryce, you take over. I'll just uh, um, try and answer the question. Sure. You've got um, Island Packers. Yes. And you have Channel Islands Aviation Correct. that go that fly to the uh, to the islands. Right. Why can't you set up a program of having private pilots besides uh, Channel Islands, maybe a limited number uh, each week or something like that, fly to the islands? Yeah. So uh, typically, aircraft delivery is is prohibited in national parks. And so if you're doing it as a commercial enterprise, you have to come under concessions, operations. I will tell you that if you are a pilot and if you are interested in doing something like that, we will have to fly a new prospectus in the next year or two to look for other vendors if you're interested. But it is, uh, we are prohibited. There's, there's only one uh, I know of airstrip in a national park where private pilots are allowed to land. That's technically in the park and on park property, and that's Grand Teton. It's like a little airport, actually. Um, and there's other places in Alaska, but in Alaska, Congress allowed it. They said uh, access by aircraft was allowed. So one thing to keep in mind with national parks is generally things are prohibited unless Congress said it was okay. And that's very different from other land management agencies. So people always ask, so why can't you hunt in a national park? Well, it's because Congress didn't say you could hunt. Yes, uh, Bryson is in charge of the mic. I am aware that um, Island Packers has been negotiating with the Santa Barbara Harbor District to try to run boats out of there. The Good. closest uh, point to the islands would probably be Prisoners Harbor. Uh -huh. Were there any uh, plans to perhaps build a campground and a ranger facility at Prisoners? Yes, so in the general management plan, there is a small campground, primitive campground that is proposed as you go up the Navy Road and then you make that first turn, that bench that's right there, that's where we proposed it. And we also proposed to build uh, some ranger 
housing. So as you go across the creek and then you turn it right down the well road, is that as we've been removing the eucalyptus, we found out it's a lot flatter up there than we thought. But we also found out there's a lot of archaeology up there. So we're going to have to figure out how to protect that because you know that was a known village site. So yes, in our plan, uh, and if you, it is on our website, you can see what our uh, plans were for that area. But most of the public wanted to see it be not a developed one like Scorpion or Santa Rosa. They wanted to see it more primitive. Yeah, it's Russell, the, um, I know there's a, in the plan a different type of concession for kayakers in the, in the future, but also like the Truth Aquatics uh, concession they have there where they, uh, is that going to be kept in service by a boat being able to go ashore, but they stay on the boat? Thanks for the gnarly question. Uh, so, um, so there's only, so there's concession and there's commercial use authorization. Okay, and what makes a difference is the amount of money they make. Okay, so concessions, when we award a contract, they pay the park service or the government a franchise fee. A commercial use authorization, so if you want to come in and say, I want to lead guided hikes, I'm an outfitter, uh, I, would, I would charge you a annual fee. And it may be something like a couple thousand dollars. You know, we would figure out what the price is. And then uh, you're not bound by any federal labor laws. A concessioner is bound by federal labor laws. So they have to pay uh, Davis Bacon wages. They got to do all these other things that they didn't have to do if you were a commercial use operator. So there's you know, some differences in the type of licenses you get. And the difference is whether you're doing work, if you're doing work in the park and you're required to be in the park and have facilities in the park versus you're doing work that's incidental to the park. So in the old kayaking, uh, way we looked at it is you could do all the kayak business outside and in fact you used to have to carry all the kayaks on island packers right and then you could do the business and then when you were done put them back on island packers to take them out so that's incidental to the park so that would be a commercial use authorization but what we found over time with the kayaking is it was having an inconvenience to the day user because it was really tying up the boat for a long period of time where they were staging kayaks so we allowed them to start staging kayaks at scorpion well, then that became more popular, and then we had to go through a commercial use authorization that required competition. And then when we start looking at their books every year, they were starting to meet the threshold that was set by the concessions law. So in the general management plan, we said we were going to move kayaking from, at Scorpion to a concessions operation. It'll be awarded to one company. That company should be announced in December. So starting next year, it'll be one company operating out of there, and then they'll be given the park a franchise fee, you know, instead of a Two thousand or three thousand dollars check at the beginning of the year. Yeah, you know, they're moving uh, a lot of people. They're kayaking. They're giving great experiences that are out there. So when it comes to Truth Aquatics, it's a little bit tougher because the Truth Aquatics, what they specialize is multi-day parties, right? And but they want the advantage of going to the island. Well, Island Packers uh, does have the sole landing rights because they're the concessionaire. So where we have allowed uh, 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 Truth Aquatics to land is with, where there's an agreement with Island Packers that they're not competing with them for users. So again, since they're a multi-day operation and they're focusing on the outer islands, Island Packers have said so far, that's okay. Island Packers could say that's not okay. And I would have to live to the, uh, up to the contract and say you can't land if you want to land. So it became an issue at Scorpion because everybody wants to go to Scorpion. <laughs> and Anna Kappa, that's true. And so there was some, um, there was some uh, actually shipping people from a truth boat to Island Packers. Uh, but that, that has to all be orchestrated. And that doesn't usually work on either of their schedules very well. So we're going to have to see how that plays out in the future. But it is an exclusive contract. It was open for bid. And Island Packers did win that. Well, I would say Island Packers won't win a bid. So, and, uh, and I, if you've all been out there, Island Packers does a remarkable job. And I will tell you, if you're on Truth and you're on a multi-day, they do a great job too. You know, uh, we really got great partners, folks. We've got really good partners that are out there. It's, it's great that so many people love the Highlands. We have time for two more questions. I was um, wondering, is the VAT 
native to the islands? Do we have any bats on the yeah, islands? Yeah, we do. We have a couple species of bats, maybe more, but you're probably thinking of the towns and vineyard bat. Well, the mosquitoes, I'm thinking if you've got the mosquito problem with the carrying the West Nile disease, if you had the bats, that might eliminate, eliminate. But it helped keep them down, that's for sure. Yeah, we do have bats. Okay. Um, you know, most of the time you, you hear about the towns and big eared bats because we have one of the only maternity colonies. Oh, really? <laughs> Unfortunately, in a historic building, <laughs> which, oh, you know, it's like, yeah. well, now how do we manage this building and protect it? We got to open the door so the bats can get in and out. Um, but, you know, that's, that's part of that balance of natural and cultural resources. So, have you ever gone to the uh, visitor center at Scorpion? And you can see there's the bakery behind it, but you always wonder, why can't I go back to the bakery? Why they got it fenced off? That's usually because the bats are there. And then when the bats aren't there, then we let you go look at it. Yeah, we wish we could replicate that habitat, but it's, it appears that the temperature is just right for that maternity colony. And, and it is one of the only maternity colonies of uh, Townsend Bigger bats in California. You know, there, it's nice having all these unique things until you're the manager. <laughs> And then it, it really adds some big challenges for you. All right, we have time for our final question. Any final questions for tonight? All right, well, great. thank you very coming. much. Yeah.